I want to welcome everyone. My name is Julianne Curran, and I'm the chair of the board of the Agri-Food Innovation Council. Thank you for joining us today for our seventh webinar in a series. Today, we are talking about the future of agri-food research and innovation in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to be your moderator for this session today. I would like to start by thanking the following organizations for partnering with us on this event. Farm Credit Canada, Ag West Bio, and Osler Hoskin and Harcourt LLP. Before we begin our moderated discussion, I have a few technical notes to share. First of all, the chat bar will not be active for the attendees. However, you are welcome to ask your questions using the Q&A button. If you see a question asked by another participant that you like, you may upvote it in order to move it up the queue. With that, we're going to begin our session. And I'd just like to set the stage and provide you with some context, what we're gonna talk about today. So the food and beverage processing um, sector is the second largest manufacturing sector in Canada. As an industry, it transforms primary commodities into high value food products and increases the value of Canadian exports. However, the industry isn't without its own challenges. It ranks 20th among OECD countries for investments in R&D. More than 80% of new products in grocery stores are developed or manufactured outside of Canada. And labor remains a crucial issue. With today's panelists, we're going to review the state of research and development in food processing, explore the potential of innovation to help address challenges, and discuss opportunities to take meaningful action to stimulate the industry's productivity and competitiveness. I'm extremely pleased to welcome our panel of experts today. Joining us are Fawn Jackson, Director of Government and International Relations with the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. Kathleen Sullivan, CEO of Food and Beverage Canada. And Carla Venton, Senior Vice President, Government Relations, Food and Consumer Products of Canada. Before we begin the moderated discussion, I'd like to invite our panelists just to say a few words about themselves and their organization. So Kathleen, why don't we start off with you? Sounds good, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathleen Sullivan. I'm CEO of Food and Beverage Canada. And my association brings together the provincial food and beverage associations uh, from British Columbia through to Atlantic Canada as well as major Canadian food processors. And collectively, we have over 1,000 uh, processors of all sizes and all products represented uh, in our membership. Um, uh, food uh, manufacturing, as you just heard, is uh, one of the most important industries. And I will just point out, while we are the second largest uh, manufacturing sector, we're actually the largest manufacturing employer with about 300,000 workers. And I know that we're here to talk about innovation and I will uh, absol absolutely acknowledge up front that there is a really significant uh, deficit in food processing uh, when it comes to the adoption of innovative technologies. But I do want to provide a little bit of context for comments I'll be making uh, throughout the day. Uh, by far the number one issue that we are facing in food processing is labor. And one of the themes that uh, will be coming out through my comments is that uh, we are struggling as a sector with some very foundational issues. Uh, companies have been in survival mode for the last 18 months through COVID. They're now in survival mode uh, because of the labor deficit. Uh, I have been flat out for the last three days working with other associations on the devastating situation that's unfolding in BC. Um, and one of the themes you'll hear me say throughout uh, the discussion today is that uh, really, uh, while we do need to look to innovative technologies and other forms of innovation to address 
uh, productivity, to address our labor situation, to address climate change, uh, it's going to be very difficult to do that until we are able to alleviate pressure on the sector and on the companies. So those are my opening comments. Great, thanks, Kathleen. Look forward to diving deeper into, into some of what you just shared. Um, Carla, how about over to you? You just want to introduce uh, yourself. Sure, thank you. I'm Carla Benton. I'm Senior Vice President over at Food, Health and Consumer Products of Canada. We're the uh, largest national industry association representing companies that manufacture and distribute the vast majority of everyday essential products on store shelves and restaurants in people's homes. Um, we have been around for a while, over 60 years now, um, and uh, this year uh, merged uh, with another association, uh, Consumer Health Products um, of Canada. Uh, so we have a broader um, uh, product, um, uh, represent more products uh, and more uh, members than we did the previous year. Um, our members range from small, independent, privately owned companies to large global multinationals, all of whom um, create jobs and invest in their communities here in Canada. Uh, you'll recognize many of our um, members, uh, member companies, brands that have been trusted for over a century. Um, we're pleased to uh, work in formal partnership with um, uh, several farm groups. Uh, we are formal partners with the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, proud to be members of the CAFTA board as well. Um, throughout the pandemic, it's been really interesting, extremely hectic, as we all know. Um, our uh, members uh, made significant investments um, to keep their workers safe. Um, and the production lines running. What's really interesting about our sector, uh, not, not only that we are uh, the largest and top employer, um, but also that you know, a lot of um, uh, manufacturers during the pandemic saw production declines. Um, and it was the opposite uh, for our se sectors. We make those essential products. And, and when we polled our members at the time and did a survey, there were some products that actually increased uh, demand by 500%. Um, so you can imagine what they had to do uh, in order to uh, do that throughout the uh, pandemic. Um, but yeah, I look forward to kind of commenting more on the kind of new and additional pressures, uh, certainly that we have um, facing us um, today, um, uh, made all the worse as, um, you know, both with the increase in holiday demand, but also, of course, the, you know, the, the situation in British Columbia. We have our supply chain team certainly um, helping out on that front. Um, I was pleased to see in the recent FPT as well, and this will probably form part of the discussion, that one of the priorities is um, innovation research. So I think that's very positive. And I would just say as well, um, my final note is just uh, congratulations to AIC for their national strategy, for, for launching kind of a national strategy on agri-food research and innovation. I think it's, it's timely. The time is definitely right. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Um, some, some great comments there. We'll look forward to, to diving into deeper uh, on some of that as well. Um, Fawn, over to you. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, as you mentioned previously, I'm Fawn and the Director of um, International Affairs and Policy with the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. And we represent cattle producers from, from coast to coast, about 60,000 of them. And uh, as I was prepping for this session, you know, thinking about uh, innovation and food processing and why would you bring somebody on who really knows a lot more about the other side of the supply chain than, than the back end of the supply chain. Uh, and I think that the key there is because it's all so linked now, right? And uh, I think that, um, you know, what, what are we thinking Thinking about at the Cattlemen's these days, and and I would give you a few uh, topics. Of course, a lot of things, uh, but you know, certainly comes to mind uh, is uh, climate change and climate change policy and solutions that we have to provide there. Uh, COVID recovery and the jobs, uh, and then also how to uh, feed the world. In that Canada is one of the few countries who is a net exporter uh, of food. And those three areas are so intrinsically linked to innovation and research and food processing uh, that, you know, I, I think that that's where that fit really, really comes in. Uh, we have uh, new national goals uh, around uh, sustainability targets, um, and a couple of them are cutting food waste uh, by half. Uh, we have uh, some on uh, carbon sequestration, uh, and then we have 
there's a number of them, but there's also one on uh, technology and innovation throughout the, the supply chain. So, you know, excited to have a, a bit more of a discussion on how we work uh, throughout the supply chain uh, on some of these solutions that uh, we all need for the future. So uh, back over to you. Great, thanks. Well, let's dive into it then. Um, I think each one of you has um, highlighted some challenges and I wanna um, go a bit deeper into discussing challenges um, that the industry has has been facing. And, uh, you know, a lot of this due to to COVID, obviously, but also climate change, enormous, um, you know, pressures on on our supply chains and and our, our sector in terms of processing. Um, but maybe just to set the stage a bit first for the attendees, can you talk about some of the challenges that the industry was facing before COVID? Um, and then talk a little bit about what's emerged as a result of COVID. And then, um, and, and then we'll move on and talk more about the future and post pandemic. And I think that also there, there's challenges related to climate change too that we can touch on, but maybe we'll just start with challenges for the industry pre COVID and what emerged as a result of COVID. So um, does anyone wanna kick off there? I think Carla, you're off mute. So why don't we start with you? Uh, yeah, sure. So I guess, uh, before and through throughout um, the pandemic, what we saw is a lot of the issues that we had prior to the pandemic just were exasperated during the pandemic. Um, and, uh, and, you know, for, for a lot of different reasons, all the costs for PPE, all of the investments made to keep um, workers safe and to encourage them to, you know, come back to the office, training new employees um, because of absenteeism, illness uh, and whatnot. So, um, so, so a lot of the challenges prior, so that would include even, you know, labor regulatory environment, um, you know, uh, large grocery store fees and penalties, those were issues kind of before. And then I, I do, it's, what's interesting as well, and I'll get to that post kind of where we are today with the new and emerging issues later, but um, it's interesting. So we did a, a member company survey. We were like to get a tap on what, what they're thinking and saying. Um, but back in June, so it wasn't that long ago, um, but we had members, you know, obviously reporting huge cost increases, um, which is impacting their production ability. Um, and then we had 60% of our members also um, in June report um, higher than normal levels of absenteeism. Um, and then we have, in June, we still had, um, half of manufacturers still operating at reduced productivity because of pandemic reasons. So that's that's in June. We've been we've been through quite many months, and it was still in June that this was half were not, you know, uh, producing uh, what they were used to. And then and then supply chain challenges uh, continue um, as well. And what we saw back in our, our survey as well at that time was. We had um, 30%, uh, and this has gotten a lot worse, so I can talk about that later, but 30% um, reported continued concerns in accessing ingredients and packaging, and 30% problems in international shipments and containers and whatnot. Um, so we can see that, you know, as we kind of uh, look forward today, there are some other issues, including, you know, the cost pressures, inflation, supply chain has only gotten worse. I would say, um, you know, the labor and some of the escalating um, grocery fee um, uh, costs and penalties. Um, but I, I'll leave it at that for now. Oh, you're on mute there. Yeah, thanks, Carla. That, that's <clears throat> great. Um, why don't we go over to you, Kathleen? Um, you know, um, you had talked about um, also challenges with labor. And, and is that <laughs> something, um, you know, obviously, it, it was probably an issue pre COVID pre pandemic, um, you know, it's obviously um, become so much more of an issue. Is, is there that and other things? Do you want to comment on on some of the challenges? Yeah, it's interesting. The number one issue that uh, that uh, food processors were facing on mass, if you will, going into COVID was labor. And, you know, a lot of that was due to structural issues, um, an aging workforce, retirements on the horizon, which, of course, we're still facing. Uh, the other big problem we have from a labor standpoint that also relates to adoption of technology is the severe shortage of skilled trades in Canada. So RBC, for example, just put out a report saying that they're anticipating a deficit of 100,000 workers. I think the date is by 2028. And we're certainly seeing that in our sector. What we've seen now with COVID is uh, added factors coming in that are impacting uh, on labor. So right now, 
um, we're talking to companies who are experience uh, vacancy rates of 20% and even more, which is really, uh, we're at a critical level at that point. Um, and part of the challenge there, just to sort of explain to you, you, you know, you, when you think about food processing, and certainly some segments of our industry, uh, where you have abattoirs, uh, meat processing, bakeries, where you've got a lot of heat. These, these can be challenging jobs and challenging work environments. You may be working in extreme heat, you may be working in extreme cold with refrigeration and freezers. And what a lot of companies would do in order to attract workers was really focus on culture. So they would make it a really great place to work in a kind of family oriented place. Well, now workers come to work with three levels of PPE, their lockers are timed, they eat their lunch in a in sort of a plexiglass bubble. So you've really lost that um, uh, sort of main factor that people were really relying on it to be able to attract workers. And when workers have now a lot of options, because let's face it, the, the, the vast majority of us have had the ability to work from home through COVID. So remember, on top of this, you're asking people to do exactly what you've asked the rest of society to not do for presumably public safety reasons. And uh, what the companies are seeing is where they had uh, they were forecasting uh, a retirement cliff, let's say in the next two years, workers are leaving earlier. And with the remaining workers, what's happening is that the companies are having to put on extra overtime shifts in order to get the same amount of product made and workers are now burning out. So uh, when we say there's a labor crisis, it's not just a shortage in terms of the number of workers or in terms of the skill set of the workers. It's also right now a crisis in terms of the pressure that we have put on these people uh, to continue to work through COVID and to continue to work in difficult situations and to work harder. And that's really the sort of um, a big debilitating factor that uh, that we're seeing right now. Great, thanks Kathleen. Um, how about over to you, Fawn? Do you wanna comment on challenges sort of pre-COVID and, and what's emerged or been exasperated perhaps during COVID? Yeah, yeah. Well, I can only uh, echo, you know, what has been said already, uh, you know, and really emphasize it, particularly on that that labor front. Um, but what I would like to start out with is, you know, perhaps some some good news too about how the food sector was able to work through uh, COVID, and uh, despite uh, enormous challenges, right, that that came forward that have been discussed. Uh, the shelves stayed, stayed stocked. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it spoke both to the tenacity of the Canadian system, but also the importance of the global trading system. And, uh, you know, what we said in the beef industry, at one point, uh, you know, we had about 50% of slaughter uh, that was that was happening, and we were importing quite a lot of uh, beef in, into Canada. And, you know, we had to say, we're happy that Canadians are able to continue eating, uh, you know, beef and this product that they have shown their absolute dedication to, because it was flying off the shelves. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that that resilience um, really, really shone through. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't take lessons out of what has uh, happened and out of um, you know, being more prepared um, for future uh, disruptions, hoping none are as significant, of course, as, as COVID, um, but, but let's be prepared for all solutions. And so, you know, one of the things that happens in the beef industry or that we, of course, look at is our processing uh, capacity. And as I mentioned, uh, and, and as Carla and, and Kathleen have talked about, the investment that went in uh, at the processing level uh, was, you know, really never heard of before uh, in the efforts to keep people safe and the efforts to, um, in the efforts to keep supply uh, moving. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think that we now have to look at, okay, uh, we 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 made it through that, uh, but how can we make it? How can we make it stronger? And you know, it's things such as what are we going to do about this labor crisis that we have right now? Yes, there's some innovation pieces that we absolutely can tackle, uh, but there's also, of course, you know, immigration that we really have to get our heads wrapped around. How are we going to do this in a meaningful way in Canada? We have uh, some of the best trade access in the world. And truly the only thing, perhaps not the only thing, one of the most significant things that is limiting us 
from just shooting through the roof on COVID recovery, uh, economic recovery it is labor. Yeah. And so let's make sure that we put everybody's minds together to, to really tackle um, the challenge that's, that's in front of us. Can I, can I uh, sort of interject, Fawn uh, was saying something that um, just sort of twigged, you know, one of the, and this really does go to technology and technology innovation, uh, you know, one of the things that we really, we knew, but we really realized through COVID is how vulnerable we, vulnerable we are from a technology standpoint, because so much of our processing equipment is fabricated offshore. So we don't have a domestic sector in Canada for uh, processing equipment, which means we're importing from the US or for, from certain European countries. And typically what that means is with our warranties, we have to use the technologists, the technicians from those companies to fix our equipment. <clears throat> and, and that was a really sort of fascinating lesson um, from when you were saying about lessons learned. I mean, that was really one of the really interesting lessons we learned was how vulnerable we are in a situation like that because we had to start trying to figure out how do we get um, technicians in from these countries when you've got not just a border closure here, but border closures all around the world. And what does that mean? Uh, not just in terms of investing in technology, but investing in technology that we can continue to maintain in a realistic uh, manner. So that was just a really sort of fascinating you know, uh, thing that came to life because of what uh, what we went through. Yeah, and if I, I could jump in as well. So those are great points. And um, um, so, so innovation has a role to play, you know? So, you know, investing in labor-saving technology is excellent. Um, and, you know, on just building on um, uh, other comments. So, yeah, we get this equipment from other countries, but then the issue is, is who's going to, who's going to uh, uh, implement this technology here in Canada. And so we're missing those skills. And so it's really interesting. So what was, um, just looking here at the, um, uh, the Canadian Agri-Food Technology um, folks came out with a report, number two barrier to technology adoption, shortage of skilled labor to implement and operate new technology. So, we need the technology then we need someone to actually imp implement and operate it and i would just say a couple points too on the labor piece that's you know it's so pressing it is challenge i mean for for all of us as well because we have different departments dealing with this we have the immigration we have we have we have labor we have ag we have industry so it is it's a bit of ping pong politics for us too because um it is a challenging um issue to to handle but I, I would say two other, uh, a couple more points on this is the, 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 the employer cost of, of vacancies is, is very worrisome. And so I recently came across the, the Food Processor Skills Canada does a lot of great stats and pulls things. And, and so according to their kind of industry-wide stats on what this cost is, so I mean, we have a whole bunch of anecdotal, you know, uh, information from companies According to them, a single unfilled position in food and beverage manufacturing industry could cost businesses as much as $100, $190 a day in lost revenue. Aggregated over the entire sector, losses from job vacancies could total up to $8.5 million in net revenue per day. If not addressed, the $8.5 million per day becomes $3.1 billion annually. So that's, that's, a, that's a pretty big hit to the industry. And then I guess just the other point I want to make across is that you know, you do have all these pressures. So we're investing in, you know, uh, the, the industry's investing in a whole bunch of things for workers and, and so they should, and it's extremely important. Um, and, and so it's always kind of the, the question is, why aren't you, you know, paying more? Well, I mean, the wages are pretty, uh, you know, pretty good. It depends on what sector and what areas. Um, but, you know, you know, and, and, and there has been definitely, um, you know, you've seen um, more uh, generous, um, you know, incentives and in trying to bring people back and make them feel comfortable, safe and, and, and pleased about where they're working. But we do know that, you know, you know, hourly wages for food manufacturers have increased 16% between June and July 2020. So that's 16%. You compare that to other manufacturing sectors during the same period, 2.5%. So 16% and 2.5%, you know, I think our industry is stepping up on that front. Yeah, so, we, you know, we've started to talk potentially about learnings and, you know, how we could use innovation. And I want to come back to that. Um, but before we just leave the talking about the challenges, I just want to make sure that there's nothing else um, that, that we really want to highlight in terms of what can we anticipate will be persisting challenges in a post 
pandemic environment or are we going to have some new challenges facing us? Is labor the, the main thing or are there, you know, are there any other um, challenges that we should be um, sort of keeping an eye on or, or aware of? I mean, labor is going to be the key make or break for this sector. I, I mean, I, I would say to you that any of the economic targets we've set uh, for uh, food manufacturing, any of the trade targets we've set, any of the climate change objectives, um, ultimately, they are, they are all going to rely on people to some extent uh, with uh, additional technology, maybe fewer people with different skills, but ultimately they require people. And if you're working uh, uh, a critical infrastructure sector that is facing 20% vacancy rates, then I will tell you, um, it's very, very difficult to focus on anything else. Uh, about a month, a couple of months ago, Minister Thompson in Ontario actually had a uh, session very much like this talking about innovation. And uh, one of my members from uh, Beanbow Canada was on it. And we were listening to people talk about technology. And uh, finally, she sort of put her hand up and said, you know, super interesting conversation, all very relevant but we are in survival mode. And part of this is bandwidth, right? Um, to, for companies to be able to focus on some of these higher order uh, ideas and concepts and looking at new and innovative things. There's definitely some companies in this country that have the capacity to do that no matter what. But remember the vast majority of food uh, manufacturing establishments in Canada have fewer than hundred employees. And even the bulk majority of that are under 50 employees. So most of the food that's manufactured in Canada is coming out, or I shouldn't say most of the food, but most of the establishments are quite small or mid-size. Um, and if they are really sort of focused on day-to-day -day survival, it just becomes really difficult for them to think about some of these things that we want them to think about in terms of a growth, increased productivity, increased investment in uh, innovation. Yeah, and if I, I could jump in as well. So, I mean, all of it is so intertwined and, and, and connected for sure. So I think that, so we know that, um, you know, during the pandemic, um, companies had to do pivoting reduce, stop making certain products, types of products in order to meet that demand. I think that we're, you know, heading into that direction with the holiday demand, the supply chain disruptions and whatnot. But what we find with our member companies, we've been hearing a lot about, yeah, it's the impact on both production costs and, and capacity. And so absolutely that labor feeds into that. We heard from our members, it's the cost. And so what the reason why cost is so important is when you're spending so much money on production costs, you're not spending money on innovation. Um, and we know that, you know, we surveyed our members just very recently um, to get a kind of a, a temperature check. Um, we know that um, they're uh, um, over the, the, uh, over the uh, 2020, their production costs increase um, by uh, 15%. Um, so that's just the production costs. Uh, the vast majority driven by the labor shortages of all the reasons we discussed. The other reason, high inflation prices, um, third reason, um, uh, supply chain. Uh, so that's both delays and limited supply of ingredients and packaging. Um, and then the fourth is the escalating uh, fees and fines by large grocery stores. So that was kind of, you know, this, the way it's all, all packaged up. Um, but yeah, it is not business as normal right now. Um, I, I will say a, com a final comment to the supply chain. So, um, you know, what we're hearing a lot in, uh, from member companies as well, and we hear hearing these words of resilience of supply chain, it was in the FPT, you know, Guelph statement as well. Um, but we're hearing from member companies, it's really uh, making a concerted effort to try to bring home their supply chains. We can't grow everything in Canada. We're not going to try. Um, but there are just, and, and that's very difficult for some areas like packaging. We just don't make all the packaging here in this country. Uh, but trying, really trying to bring home the supply chain and try to reshore. Um, and it is very difficult to do. Um, but I think uh, there are a lot of companies kind of rethinking things now. They're looking at the supply chain challenges that are largely out of their control. Um, and they're kind of doing a rethink. I would just add in, you know, for the, for the beef sector, our challenge through COVID was processing capacity. Our challenge prior <laughs> to COVID was processing capacity and our challenge post COVID is processing capacity, particularly in Eastern Canada. And right now we are at 100% utilization rate on average over the last number uh, five years. And that can work in some ways. Uh, for example, if we have access to the US market, 
Um, so if we're able to sell into uh, the packers down there, then the functionality of the overall North American market um, can, can be maintained. But say there's a trade irritant that comes into place, say there is a reason we're not allowed to cross borders anymore, <laughs> say there's, you know, all of these things, you just really realize how big that, that risk is when you're utilizing your full capacity on a product that is essential to, you know, human survival, that, you know, product being food. And so I think that we need to uh, think about about that and it's not only getting to levels that are appropriate for these companies to be able to operate but that we actually need a buffer uh, in there and we have a buffer in in western Canada uh, some could argue that it could be bigger and I'm sure some could argue that it could be less um, but we know we know in eastern Canada that we're that we're at our uh, max and so um, that's a big lesson for us coming out that that's uh, that needs to be addressed. Okay, thank you, you all uh, for those comments. Um, I want to also just sort of shift gears and talk about opportunities that perhaps have emerged throughout COVID. We've, you know, really talked a lot about the, the challenges um, and the issues facing the sector, but, um, you know, Farm Credit Canada noted that while the pandemic brought losses that could never be recouped, it also accelerated underlying trends that promote opportunities for food processors to thrive. And so examples are demands for local, um, convenient, healthy, sustainable foods. Um, do you see some opportunities as a result of COVID um, that have emerged for the sector? Um, that can be taken advantage of in a post-pandemic environment. Yeah, I could. Oh, go ahead, Fawn. Okay. You know, one of the things that I always think about, or perhaps a, a good comparison is that when we're cutting up the beef carcass, we think about each different cut of beef going to the consumer who is most willing uh, to pay for it. And that's how we're able to get the most value return for our producers and for truly the whole Canadian uh, economy. And if that means that some cuts are going into a local market and some cuts are going into the European market and some you know, liver is going into Peru and offals are going into Asia, that's wonderful. <clears throat> And I think that we need to not lose that bigger picture of Canada is a trading nation. We are in the beef industry, we export 50% of what we uh, produce. 90% of Canadian farmers and ranchers are dependent on trade. So while I think it's really exciting uh, to have this focus on food right now, I think we have to make sure that we don't lose um, the value of both having these uh, deliverables at home, but our responsibility and our opportunity uh, globally. So, um, you know, I, I think that as we're thinking about all of Canadian agriculture or all of, you know, food, how do we make sure that we're getting those mushrooms from Ontario into, you know, the hands of the consumer who's willing to pay, I don't know how much mushrooms go for, <laughs> but, you know, uh, you know, $20 per kilo, and we're getting other ones uh, into markets that, that are perhaps at a different price point. And on the sustainability front, I think it is our responsibility that all of those products are sustainable and that they all might have different levels of information that perhaps goes with them, some which might take a lot more effort and perhaps some demand a different price, but that they all are delivering in some manner on the sustainability goals that we have. So those would be my uh, points on, on that point of the conversation. And I just have a couple comments and on the sustainability front too, but um, what, before I get to that is one of the things that I think it's a silver lining because when you kind of have um, uh, very challenging times, you know, there's a lot of communication going um, with, uh, uh, with government and with the media and the public. So people are paying attention to what's going on and how come I don't have my you know, favorite product on a store shelf. So, so people call it, people, Canadians actually learned about the sector more than ever. Uh, so I think that's a silver lining. Um, we uh, we did some polling as well with our member, uh, sorry, with Canadians, 
and it showed that 82% of Canadians better understand how these essential products are made. So I'm speaking about essential food, health and consumer goods are made. And then number two is because they kind of know how they're made, they know how it impacts them because they're not getting those products on store shelves anymore. 93% want governments to actually take action to ensure that they have these essential products on store shelves. So I thought that was interesting. A crisis actually brings uh, information to consumers and Canadians to understand and not take for granted that the products are always going to be on those store shelves. And then on that sustainability piece that Vaughn was talking about, <clears throat> so we do know that, um, yes, and Canadians are interested in smaller packaging with less environmental footprint. And I think there's huge opportunities there um, uh, for Canada to take and to lead in the world, um, you know, in our kind of new plastic economy. And we're certainly, we have a, a sustainability, um, um, I have a sustainability colleague who works just on this very issue. Um, but there are, is opportunities for, you know, kind of innovation to look into the types of packaging that can be uh, recycled and reused um, and, and, and reduced. So I think that um, Canada has a good opportunity there. And we, we are very, um, we don't have a lot of packaging uh, capability here in this country, and whether it's just plain packaging that you would have food products in, but certainly not sustainable packaging. So big opportunities there. And on that front as well, thinking about Canadians, yeah, they want smaller packaging uh, on, on, the, on the one hand, right? And then, but on the other hand, you have Health Canada who said, no, you have to put more and more information on the, the product package. Um, and I'm not talking about important information like allergy labeling. Obviously that should be very front and center, but it's like, no, no, more information, more information. So what's happening, a product package like this is becoming a larger package or it's not becoming larger, but you're having unsustainable um, and not recyclable materials like accordion labeling being added onto that package, which you can't actually recycle because it's just so difficult that they're having to play around. So I think that there's opportunities on that um, front for in you know Health Canada, work with Environment Canada, but Health Canada, when you're considering labeling changes, you must consider the environmental impact in a climate lens, as we know in the last mandate letters was on a couple uh, ministers' uh, mandate letters, but the climate lens. And then just the final point on that is we can't fit all information that Canadians want to know. And Canadians do want to know a lot of information about their products, and so should they. But we can't fit it all in the product package. But we should provide that information. A whole bunch of information could be provided. So I would just urge the government, and I think it's a big opportunity, look at digital labeling. Like FHCP brought di digital labeling, the smart label, and launched it here in Canada. Um, it would nice, it'd be nice to get that kick started, but without the government signaling to us that, yeah, we're actually going to look at it, it's really hard to get companies to invest millions of dollars to, you know, put forward this digital platform of smart label in which they have a whole bunch of product information. So I think, so, I'm, so my kind of angle is more, I guess, on the kind of packaging sustainability and, and the consumer trends that we're seeing today. And also the final point on the digital labeling, during the pandemic and even now, it's changed a lot of the behavior on how we shop. We're not going to the store and picking up a product and looking at the package. We're going online. So all the more reason that you do need digital labeling. So. Thanks, yeah, so I'll, I'll go back to sort of uh, the FCC um, quote or, or reference to their report. I mean, I think, yeah, you know, you're always looking at different trends, consumer trends. Uh, you know, I always call it the, the short, the shiny thing in the room. And I think that um, we often in public dialogue or discussion about this sector and probably any sector, everybody wants to talk about the sexy new thing. And that's fine and that's great. Those are important things. Uh, they're not all going to be transformational though. And I think what we need to be careful is that we're not focusing on those shiny objects to the um, complete distraction of also talking about sort of the fundamentals and, and the whole industry. And, you know, to Fawn's comment, I mean, I'm really somebody who believes in balance. I mean, we have certain areas <laughs> of agriculture production where you can't just sell everything local. It just doesn't make sense. You couldn't derive the value you need, obviously, particularly on the livestock side. And even just on that local angle, I mean, I can tell you, I, I've barely slept this week. I mean, since Monday night, um, we have been flat out uh, working with uh, emergency services, coordinating industry on the ground in BC. And in a kind of ironic <laughs> shift, our focus has been on how do we um, overcome all the barriers that uh, sadly are, are, we're seeing in BC right now to try to bring product in uh, because local production, I, I mean, even if it existed of sufficient capacity has uh, been wiped out. So, so I, think, I think we really have to sort of look at our whole portfolio. 
Um, and obviously, at the end of the day, you know, um, these sectors are big economic uh, engines, both primary agriculture inputs, uh, food manufacturing, but ultimately they also have sort of a social policy component to them as well, which is food security, food sustainability. And so we kind of have to look at the whole portfolio from that standpoint as well and make sure that we are balancing all of these different objectives to the best that we can. Thanks, Kathleen. So, you know, I think so far, um, each one of you has highlighted challenges. Um, you know, we've talked about opportunities and, and through your comments, um, I think there's been some examples provided of how innovation um, can help to address the, the challenges or take advantage of the opportunities. Um, so just wondering if, if we can uh, go a bit further on, on that and just talk about um, innovation um, and you know, should we be looking at innovation in food processing um, differently than we do in agriculture? Um, we talked about, um, you know, some potentially um, needs with innovation with um, automation and, and perhaps that's relevant in agriculture and, and food processing, but just wondering about um, just some, some of your thoughts on, on that, um, the role of innovation or, or you know, how innovation could address some of these challenges, take advantages, and, and is it different for the food processing sector than for the, the more traditional production um, commodity sector? So, so I'm happy to kick it off. Um, I, I, would, I would talk about innovation in two contexts because you can have tons of different innovation, innovative processes, innovative um, technologies, all that. There is absolutely zero doubt, and you pointed out early on where we rank in terms of investment in R&D uh, from um, you know, the, the, the food processing sector. We are way behind in terms of automation, robotics, AI as well. Um, there is zero doubt, I think, on the part of anybody in the sector that that deficit has to be addressed. Um, we already punch above our weight relative to other countries in terms of agriculture production, agriculture exports, processing exports, uh, but we're kind of resting on our laurels a little bit, and we definitely need to address that deficit. And, and certainly, you know, there's lots of reports that have been out about, about what has to happen with government programs and things like that. So that has to be a priority. Um, and, but then you've got innovate, innovation, for example, when it comes to packaging with respect to sustainability goals as well. So there's lots of different other types of innovation too. The second one I want to focus on though is the innovative approaches to how we're looking at these problems and trying to overcome them. And I think that um, COVID has helped spur this on as well. And I think, you know, that goes, and I, I see this on the primary production side as well, the fragmentation of industry. And I think one of the things that we have to be doing much better, and I am certainly uh, have been seeing uh, through COVID, is the ability to work together. So uh, it's not, uh, you know, I've got to work with Fawn, for example. I've got to work with other groups in my sector. The companies have to start working together. And we are absolutely seeing um, this necessity. And I think that is also true on technology and innovation. I mean, what there was a study done a couple of years ago by a group and they they were uh, they were inventorying the innovation assets across food processing. So um, uh, test kitchens, these sorts of things. And they actually discovered there was quite a lot of innovation assets, but the innovation assets didn't even speak to each other. And we really have to start finding ways to configure industry in such ways because obviously talking to ourselves has not solved these problems. We have to find ways to figure out how to talk to each other and how to talk to government. There's there's one project I'll just point out that I think is uh, probably the most innovative thing I have worked on in my time here. And it's actually a project with Treasury Board where we are very early stage innovation, looking at ways to measure the regulatory, bur the burden of regulations. And now as we move into a second phase of that product, looking at ways to compare regulatory burden across jurisdictions, which could ultimately completely shift, not just what regulations we make, but how we go about regulating, which can actually help ease some of that burden on industry. And, and it's that it really that what's innovative about that is the willingness of the groups involved, which is a university, government, provincial government, municipal government industry to sit in a room um, risk free 
and explore concepts and be able to fail. And I think that's something we're not particularly good at and that we really need to focus on if we're really committed to innovation. Innovation is a culture as much as it is a thing. <clears throat> yeah, I like that. The innovative approaches as well as, as just um, beyond just the innovation itself. Um, Carla, do you want to chime yeah, in on that? Just yeah, using innovation sure. to address the challenges and opportunities? Yeah. Sure. So, and you know, in the uh, so packaging, uh, you know, uh, different types of um, innovation, but but pack packaging. There's just so much there. I think that um, we can do more of, um, and I think it benefits. You know, going back to that the 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 question too is, um, it's integrated. So, it, 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 you know, the the innovation that we do in one part of the kind of uh, value chain will impact the other, and I mean benefit the whole the whole value chain. So, I think it's important. But for example. You know, packaging um, innovation that keeps food fresher, safer, um, and obviously has lesser, you know, uh, uh, um, that is greener. Um, that 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 impacts the whole uh, the whole value chain um, to be able to do that. Having having products that have more shelf life, um, that's uh, definitely uh, extremely uh, convenient for those who can't shop as frequently as they would like as well. Um, and then just on so yeah, so you know, there's the the, the innovation. There's kind of the uh, process innovation um, as well. And so I kind of see opportunities there on uh, just production line efficiencies, right? Um, and producing, and which, which, is a, which is a big deal. And there's some companies moving quickly in this area um, and producing less food waste. Again, this is good for the whole value chain, producing less, using less energy and less water in these production line, in these production lines. And I think that there's big opportunities there and automation and um, can really help in that area. Um, and then I guess as well, um, uh, this, the product innovation is really interesting. Um, and, uh, and what is it that, that companies need? So we have the, you know, the process innovation, the product innovation. What do companies need here to invest in that innovation here in Canada? Uh, and it really goes back to, it's that enabling regulatory environment. Um, so our members certainly have um, some pretty big concerns about um, some things that Health Canada are doing. Most recently, they're supplemented food regulations, um, which is, you know, a product, let's just say a beverage product that you're adding different vitamins and minerals to. Um, their proposal is, let's put an exclamation mark on that um, to scare consumers into consuming something that's already been approved safe. But the second thing that's really important as well is you can't, you're not allowed to um, make positive claims. Like you're not, the, the, the regulations or proposed regulations say, you can't talk about the good stuff you have in the product. Um, so how are you supposed to say that it has vitamin, extra vitamin B or calcium or whatnot in there? So we have companies specifically on these supplemented food regulations who are saying, and who invest a lot of money here in Canada, hire thousands of Canadians are saying, these regulations as they stand will ensure that we will not invest in product innovation in this country. Um, so there are things within that, in, that, that regulatory environment to enable innovation. And like I said, we're hearing straight from companies that you know, the examples like this um, uh, do not help. That's a, another um, sort of comment. Like I, I think of what you talked about, Kathleen, in terms of that fragmentation and how we need to work together and innovative approaches. Like we need to do that even, you know, ourselves with, with regulators, right. And, and government to, to work together towards ensuring that Canada is, um, you know, increasing our pro productivity and competitiveness, um, which is, a, should be a goal for, for all. Um, any mm -hmm. comments from you to add uh, Fawn on, on the question of um, innovation? Um, to address challenges or take advantages of opportunities and processing um, innovation compared to agriculture um, or traditional innovation? Yeah, I guess to your question of are they different, um, and I would say no. They both need more investment and they both need long-term strategic investment uh, that is very stable. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that working from that foundation uh, is a really great place uh, to, to start. And, you know, to um, Kathleen's point is that we, we need more integration. And so if we funded them entirely separately or in entirely different ways, I think that that would actually be a really dangerous road to go down. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that we need to think about that when we are um, putting out plans on, on how to do this. And, you know, I would also 
just note that I got back from COP not too long ago. And, you know, in some ways I was really, you know, you, you feel sort of worried uh, that people are now paying so much attention to the food system. And in some way you also feel so relieved and you think finally, <laughs> right? And, um, you know, I think that there's going to be more investment in food and agriculture production, uh, perhaps than we've ever seen, uh, you know, the billions of dollars that have been committed to finding solutions and recognizing that food production is 25% of the world's greenhouse gases there, there and about, um, is, is that, you know, there's dollars coming and the best thing that we can do to drive future solutions that are both going to drive the amount of food that we need to uh, produce and do it in a sustainable manner is by investing in research and, and innovation. So, you know, I, I think exciting times ahead, um, as long as we can keep it, um, you know, keep the voices at the table who really understand these topics. Because I think sometimes, you know, when we come at an issue from only one angle, we think this is the solution. It is here. Oh my gosh. And then you don't fully understand how it interacts with that full system. So, you know, really goes back to why we need so much uh, collaboration and, and sitting down uh, at the table. I think the other thing I'll add is, you know, often, again, it's, I guess, back to the sort of shiny object thing. You know, people think of innovation as having to be disruptive, right? Mm -hmm. And most innovation isn't disruptive. It, it's a step. It steps forward. And I, I think we have to rethink that as well, that if you're not sitting at home, if we're not talking about, you know, AI, then we don't want to talk about it. It's not really innovative. And that's just not the case. And there's, again, this sort of different way we're going to have to start looking at these things if we want to start to address uh, this issue. And that's um, saying if you're interested in innovation and you want to pay attention to it, it, it maybe it is a bit tedious, but that is what is necessary to move ahead with progress. And sometimes it's that sort of those small steps that ultimately you end up discovering something that may be disruptive, but you still have to go through that process. So I'm going to talk about um more sort of shift into the sort of support from from government and I know I know we've mentioned that um, a bit throughout the conversation so far but um, the fact that implementing innovation can be capital intensive for companies um, so when you look at existing policy and programming from federal and provincial governments how would you describe um, the level and type of assistance that's offered to to processors to food processors to enable innovation well I'll jump in Sure, go ahead. I'll, I'll just jump in here. It's, uh, what, what we kind of hear from our member companies, it really depends on um, the province, that each uh, individual provinces in which they operate. I'll say that there is a tendency within um, ICID is really focusing on the big thing, not so much as Kathleen was saying that the, you know, the stepwise approach on um, innovation, it might not be the most exciting thing to ICID, but it is part of the part of the process of the step forward. Um, so th those are kind of the challenges that we see, but I really, um, um, you know, just going back to this, uh, yes, yeah, so this, the Canadian agri-food technology report, I thought it was really interesting. So they interviewed, um, you know, food manufacturers from across the sector and it is, so it is different, um, that barriers to tech adoption are different according to subsector. So what is this, the barrier for, Food manufacturing is not the same for ag tech, grain and seed, horticulture, or livestock. But what they do say for food manufacturing, and overwhelmingly so, is 74%, the number one barrier, 74% cost of equipment and or installation. So that's overwhelmingly um, very high. Um, so then my, my point here is um, policy and programs should reflect the number one barrier, which is cost. Um, and then, and I mean, in that way, what is it? How, how, how are these programs um, formed? Is it uh, accelerated capital cost allowance? So tax write-off, is it a loan, which we hear are, is not helpful for our member companies because they can get loans from the bank or is it a grant? Um, so, so that's the cost piece must be addressed. That's the most important. And then, and then a, 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 a second, so you got 74% cost is the number one barrier, 53% labor. Is the number one barrier and again it's that shortage of skilled labor to implement and operate this new technology 
So again, if we want policy and programming to support, um, then that would speak to the need for that reskilling piece and to find that or bringing in those that global expertise um, easily into this country, integrating them, letting them stay here in order to operate that equipment. So I think that the policy and programs need to reflect the top barriers to adoption. Yeah, so um, interestingly, there was a, a survey done a little while ago looking at what are the funding programs available federally and provincially for, for companies. I said actually did it. Um, and I would say it's kind of piecemeal. And that's not a surprise to me, right? Because governments tend to announce programs that are announceable. And so you, you may get a program that is um, focused on seafood companies in Atlantic Canada, or you'll get one focused on rural processors in Manitoba, right? They, so it tends to, you sort of have this piecemeal approach when you put it all together and there's no, first of all, overall strategy here. We don't really have an industrial strategy as a country we haven't for a long time. Um, in terms of the, the programs that we see at the federal level out of ISAID, uh, they tend to be large, so they're really not appropriate for a mid-sized company that's looking at investing in automation and increasing capacity. Um, they also, in many cases, kind of perversely, are linked to job creation, which is a very old school way of looking at industrial policy, right? Back in, back in the days, you wanted companies to be making investments that would create jobs. Whereas we are at a, a place right now as a country where we have more work than we actually have people for, and that's creating a problem. And the other problem that has happened with government programs is that often, and we've all seen it, it's not just sort of programs for innovation. We saw it with uh, programs for, you know, support programs for COVID, for example. The application timeframes are often very short. They don't necessarily line up with the planning cycles of companies. And so, I mean, I, I need to be able to budget further ahead if I'm making a capital investment, right? Or sometimes they require you to make the investment before they'll pay you the money, which is also a hurdle. So there's this, there's a certain disjointedness where the programs are structured in such a way that they really don't suit the needs of industry and how industry operates. And that, that's going to have to sort of shift as well. Um, so there's definitely a need to sort of take a look at these programs and one, uh, and obviously some will always come from the federal government, some from the provincial governments, but ultimately you want to have an industrial policy that is going to be a, a blanket across the whole country, uh, even if it's putting different pieces together. And then you've got to develop those programs in such a way that they actually work for the companies in terms of their planning horizons, their planning timelines, uh, their, the, the capital they can actually put in. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, anything to add from Carla, do you, do you want to build on that? Yeah, I will. Like, it's, it's interesting, too. And, and what, one of the challenges that we find as well is that it's coming um, from ICID. Uh, government support is very much treating, um, you know, food manufacturing the same as other sectors in terms of at the level of, of, of how automated or innovative our industry is. So, for example, you can't compare us to the auto sector, which is highly automated, but was also done by political will of this government. And so when you have that lens or, you know, you know, we're in the same bucket of money with, you know, auto and aerospace, it makes it very difficult because we're just not at the same, we're not at the same stage. Um, and so, and again, uh, you know, it's that lens of, it has to be this really big, um, you know, uh, groundbreaking change. And, and a lot of our member companies are like, no, no, that's not what I actually need. I just want to, <laughs> like, I want to automate, I want to update my production line so that it's greener, it's more efficient, I'm producing less food waste, and hopefully even, you know, not um, uh, using as much labor. Um, and so it's this kind of lens that ICID has. It's, they're more of the vision, but it doesn't reflect necessarily the reality of the needs of the sector. Thanks for that. Ron, do you want to chime in? Um, Okay, well, I, um, I just want to remind attendees, feel free to um, put any of your questions into the, the Q&A um, boxes there and, and we can address them. I'm going to ask um, one more question formally here to our panelists. And um, I think it's, it's something that we've, we've touched on throughout. And, and so perhaps we're just um, sort of recapping um, with some, some final thoughts here. But, um, you know, 
you talked about the differences in the food processing sector from other sectors, but um, food processing is intrinsically linked to the agri-food system. And do you think that there are prom promising area, areas, excuse me, of research and innovation um, elsewhere in the sector that could benefit um, the food processing sector if implemented? Well, I don't, I, I'm not really sure about uh, so much of the, the, the research being done in other parts of the sector, but I would say that, you know, it's interesting, um, we have these fourth wave technologies, right? So, you know, the, the drones, the sensors, the AI and whatnot. What I, you know, just interesting to see what's happening in BC, see what's happening in, in, in China, see with the containers um, and the ports and the, 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 all the supply chain disruptions and delays is there more opportunity um, uh, to invest in drones for transportation? So I know that um, because it seems to me um, we don't have a lot of rail lines in this country or highways and things are cut off. You see in BC right now, we can't control what's going on in China uh, with their containers. We can't control a lot of the supply chain issues. Are there opportunities to invest in drones or other innovative ways to overcome these transportation bottlenecks. Investing in transportation port infrastructure is not something done overnight. I think every government in recent history has promised that they will make it more efficient and, and whatnot. But we're seeing that if you have natural disasters like in BC, that's a, it, it's still a, it's still a huge snag. So so I I don't know, um, but I think that. Um, yeah, investment in some sort of drones or technology or whatnot to overcome those very costly transportation and infrastructure challenges that Canada has, but also all over the world. Maybe I would just speak, maybe not so much on the processing side, um, but sort of, you know, to a whole system and try and bring in a, a real life example here um, of some of the exciting things that are, that are going on. Uh, so we know everybody wants more sustainability uh, information and we know everybody wants um, more climate change deliverables coming from the whole supply chain. And uh, an area of pretty exciting innovation for us uh, is um, virtual fencing. And so uh, it's particularly being tested in British Columbia um, where they're utilizing grazing to uh, mitigate fire risk by reducing uh, the low brush um, loads. Uh, and, but I think that 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 type of a pilot project can now be replicated into so many different things. You know, we talk a lot about the crop livestock integration. Well, all the fencing is gone across the prairies now. So how are we going to, you know, utilize cover crops or um, utilize this sort of new grazing approaches that we that we want to use? So, you know, I think there's something really exciting um, that that that's happening on the farm. But then how do we transfer that information through <laughs> through the, the supply chain and, and get it to the other end? And I would say that um, the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef has been uh, working on, you know, identifying, okay, here's some producers that are doing some really amazing stuff. We went, we checked, we've audited, and now we're able to um, transport that, that audit verification all the way uh, through the supply chain. But it's not without its challenges. Uh, and so, you know, I think that those types of investments and, you know, really looking at these examples that we have and say, okay, well now how do we replicate this on a bigger scale, you know, investing in traceability, investing in, you know, virtual fencing that works in different weather conditions or on different sizes of animals, you know, I think that that's where some of that excitement is, is going to be, and then enables the processors to deliver that information to their clients who is able to deliver that information, you know, ultimately to, to the customers. And I think that uh, going forward, that's gonna make Canada very competitive in a world that is asking for that, that information um, and, and those results, you know, ultimately that's, that's certainly what we're trying to get to. So just thought I'd bring forward a couple of tangible examples. That's yeah, I think, I, think one of the, I think one of the challenges we have is that, um, that um, question of where do you turn for inspiration when it comes to innovation in a Canadian context, it's a bit um, 
haphazard in a sense. There is no sort of central repository or place where there are ongoing discussions about that. So it may be a specific project as Fawn described that then has the potential, but somebody really has to drive that. And in large, and a lot of times you only learn about these things because you're on a panel like this. And so I think that really goes back to the idea of do we have a culture of innovation in this sector and have we established the mechanisms that are needed in order to think about things like pilot projects and early stage innovation and then how do we translate that into something that can be used more broadly but then also perhaps jump into other sectors for us right now for example when it comes to equipment uh technology or um it's really other countries, right? And one of the, the things there is that we just, we don't have a domestic equipment manufacturing sector in this country for food processing. And so you're, you're not creating, you don't have that idea, um, a sandbox that already exists here. And so companies are traveling outside of the country to trade shows there and they're looking at what different options are there. So, so there is that question. That's been a question that's been around for a long time, which is, do we need to establish something like that here? Can we even support something like that here? Do we have an industry that's large enough? And if we don't bring that sort of um, uh, industry into Canada and domesticate it, do we create the sort of idea pool that you need to further some of this stuff? Um, yeah, that, that's great. Great comments um, from all of you and, and insights throughout uh, the whole um, session today. Um, I'm just looking to see if we have any uh, questions from the participants and not seeing anything there. Um, I just wanted to um, just thank you all so much for your time today, um, for taking the time to share your insights, your ideas, your thoughts on, on the challenges, the opportunities, innovation, the role that innovation can play. It's, it's been really, for me, I've taken lots of notes and I, I think it's been, um, you know, a really valuable conversation for us to, to have together and facilitate, um, you know, the role of AIC is to advocate for the sector, the agri food sector, which includes food processing on innovation. And so it's really critical to, to have your um, your contributions to that that dialogue. So appreciate um, you being with us today. And I just want to thank also everybody for attending. Um, and just in closing, and I think this is um, also very topical, but I just wanted to mention our, our eighth webinar um, that's scheduled for December 9th. Um, and the, the focus is on the people challenge attracting talent and skilled labor in the agri-food sector. So it's very fitting um, for that to follow, follow this particular session. So um, with that, just thank you all again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thanks, bye-bye. Thanks, bye.